I keep teasing Frank, but you know, I'm going to paint that brimmed polka dot if you guys don't agree to take it. But we actually did. polka dot. <laughs> <laughs> Three polka dots. Three polka dots. So anyway, uh, Mr. Nicholas, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lewis. Uh, my name is Brian Nicholas. I'm a project manager with Obeck Consulting Engineers. We're an Oregon firm uh, specializing primarily in bridges, but we do a number of other transportation and infrastructure type of projects. Um, we are the lead consultant on a team of consultants that it takes to put together a project like this to permit it and um, get it out, to, out uh, into construction, manage construction, and ultimately complete and get certified. So, um, I imagine that uh, most everybody here in the room knows something about the project and history and of its development. So what I decided to do was simply put together a simple stat sheet for this project. Um, this is a project fact sheet that has some of the basics uh, about the project status as it stands right now, the budget, the scope, uh, some schedule information. So I thought we'd go through that and then um, we can answer any questions that you have. So um, the county is embarking on a two to three year project to rehabilitate uh, the Green Bridge. And I think everybody involved in the project recognizes how important that bridge is to the community, that it's a focal point for the city of Sheridan. Um, track just about everybody who is in the head and straight into Portland from the north side of the river crosses over that bridge. So there's a lot of traffic on that bridge. So it's a vital link that keeps the city connected. So that's a, a, a theme that we have in addressing this rehabilitation. Um, some basic uh, statistics, that bridge was uh, funded by uh, the Federal Public Works Administration in 1938. Although no uh, determination of effect has ever been done on the bridge, uh, if one were to be done, we will be doing a determination of effect. We'll find out that it is uh, eligible for listing on the National Register of, of Historic Places. So that uh, adds a little more uh, oomph to the project in terms of uh, maintaining the character of the bridge, maintaining uh, uh, the, the working function of the bridge as it stands today. So, like everything else that has federal dollars attached, this project is caught up in the federal funding uh, situation as it stands. So what we've provided here is a snapshot of what the funding looks like right now. Uh, it is, a, it is a, phased, a phased construction project, so we'll be working to put together a logical sequence where we can tackle phase one construction and then come back in a later phase and wrap up the re rehabilitation without tearing out anything we did on the first go around. So um, that's that's how it stands. Uh, scope wise, um, this is a you know, it's a fixed budget project, so we need to do the best we can to stretch those dollars. And one of those strategies uh, for stretching those dollars is getting this into construction as soon as possible, because right now is a tremendous time. It's a tremendous bidding environment. Uh, to maximize the value of your dollar if you're going into construction. So that's one of, that's one of the go, um, fundamental uh, strategies that we're using. Uh, we do have some scope goals, some minimum uh, scope items that we want to tackle in this project to maintain the character of the bridge, uh, prolong the life of the bridge. Uh, and first and foremost is dealing with the steel truss. Everybody can see the paint is failing out there. There is some corrosion on the bottom cord below the deck. So the first three items really are all structural. We're, uh, we're going to repair the uh, structural steel uh, truss to reestablish its original load carrying capacity. We're going to tent the bridge. We're going um, to abate all the lead paint that's on it, prep it, and coat it with a good 20 to 30 year life uh, coating system. Uh, about the longest that you can get in the industry for, for a structure like this. We'll be rehabilitating the decks and sidewalks. Right now you can see it's pretty rough out there, but the structure underneath is nice and sound. So we're going to give that a new, a new finish on top on both the decks and sidewalks. We'll be rehabilitating the pedestrian rail. The biggest blessing on this bridge is the fact that the rail today meets current bridge design standards. So we'll clean it up, we'll patch it up, uh, nice coat of paint, we'll, we'll uh, refinish the concrete and probably apply a, a ceiling type of paint to the concrete. It'll look like a new rail when it's all done. This bridge really will look an awful lot like a new bridge when it's done. Uh, we'll be replacing that concrete barrier that's right along the edge of, uh, of the sidewalks with a new steel tube uh, traffic barrier. We'll be upgrading the bridge for seismic, uh, current seismic standards for a phase one. Um, 
and I can answer questions about that if you have questions about what phase one means. Uh, we'll need to do some scour protection for the bridge to make sure the foundations stay sound for the long haul. And there'll be some miscellaneous work like curb repair and that sort of thing um, where there's cracks and, and the items that need to be touched up. So that's the basics of what we're going to try to tackle with the scope. Schedule. Um, we are pushing to get this project on the street as soon as we can. Right now, because of the funding issue, um, uh, ODOT has committed to the county to have funding available for a November 2012 bid, and that's, what, that's the date you see here. That's our worst case scenario date, ODOT's committed to that. We're working to position the project for an earlier bid, we'd like to bid it in the spring, uh, so that we can get all of our summertime work done in good weather, uh, containment, abatement, and painting during the time of the year where we don't have to worry about moisture developing while we're trying to paint the bridge. So that is, that's our goal. Uh, and I know conversations are going on right now to, to try to make that a reality. So the dates that you see here are worst case scenario. This is the, this is the firm commitment that ODOT's uh, committed to. We're trying to position it for an earlier start. And, and Brian, not to interrupt you, but to, a lot of this happened because of the uncertainty that you hear back in Washington right now. And what they're doing is originally they wanted to fast track this project in uh, with OVEC, we started the design about a month, uh, maybe even two months ago. So we had figured that March uh, would be a bid letting. Uh, how was it? We were March 22nd. Yeah. March would be the bid letting, and construction would happen in 2012. Right now, that that is still our goal. Um, it, it just all has to, uh, you know, what the transportation bill looks like when it comes out of Congress what the, the monies are available. As Brian said, they are committed to doing this project in 2013. It'll go out to bid in, in November of 2012 and construction in 2013. And as he said, our goal is still to have construction in 2012. I'm going to touch on uh, public outreach and then we can open the floor to, to questions. Sorry I'm running through this without stopping for questions, but I kind of want to get through the basics and then, and then uh, we can uh, field questions that you have. Public outreach. Like I said, uh, I think the entire project team understands the significance of this bridge and the significance of the community. So we do have a public involvement process that we'll be <coughs> implementing for the project. Tonight is sort of the first step, the very first step in that public involvement process, uh, presenting the, stat the initial status to you and then we'll be returning uh, to meet with you throughout at a, at a few milestones along the way. Uh, so that you can get a look at where the project's at status-wise, um, and we'll be able to inform the public about uh, the, the progress on the project as well. Right now, we have three open houses planned. Those are for the public to come in and learn about the bridge. Our first one, we're planning for October of this year, and uh, with a bridge like this, there's not a whole lot of variables. Um, you know, it's, it started out as a green bridge, and uh, the state historic preservation officer is going to want to see it remain a, a green bridge. Um, the rail, we're not doing modifications to the rail that much. We're trying to preserve it as, it as it is, as it was when it was originally constructed. So our opportunity for public input, for decisions, basic decisions about the project, um, isn't as numerous as it might be on some projects. However, we're working to identify where we can get public input, where, where local citizens could have some input on basic decisions that are made about the project. Um, we will be, one, one example is we'll be accessing the bridge from, I'll use the, the, the photo I have here, um, to rehabilitate, rehabilitate the trust when we don't want to impact traffic any more than absolutely necessary. So we'll be accessing, we'll build an access along here along the ground at the edge of the park. And you know, during construction, that's going to impact the, the stairs there. So one, one item for public input might be, how do we reconfigure a new park entrance? Uh, that sort of thing, too. Um, as, a, as a thank you to the citizens uh, that have participated in the project, as well as just, um, you know, let's make a nice portal for the, for the uh, park because we're going to be impacting it. Let's do our best to reestablish a nice park entrance when we're done. That's one example of some of the items that we'll be seeking public input on, and we'll be working with our public involvement firm to really scour out what our alternatives are, try to find as much opportunity for public input as we can. 
our follow-on, because this project's going to move very, very fast, we have a limited window for, for receiving public input and then being able to implement it. So that first open house is really going to be our only public <coughs> input session. Following that, those will be, uh, the following two open houses will be more like uh, confirmation uh, presentations to the public so they can see how we implemented the input that they provided to the team, as well as updating them on schedule and what traffic impacts are going to look like and that sort of thing. So that's a, a, a short briefing on our open house strategy. The city already has a, uh, a project link on the city website and we'll be enhancing that as the project develops so people can click on that link and find out exactly what's happening with the project when. Uh, we'll probably be updating that on a, on a weekly basis. One of the key things is uh, um, we're going to be closing lanes intermittently. We're going to try to keep that as, as, as to a minimum um, as much as possible. But we'll never close both lanes at the same time. So we'll always have at least one lane open. We'll be able to pass traffic. But there are times when we're going to have to close one lane. We'll use the website to make sure people know exactly when that's going to occur and have plenty of, of heads up about when that's going to occur. Um, like I said, we're going to, we are going to keep it open for traffic throughout construction. I think that will relieve um, a lot of concerns that, that we expect to receive about impacts to traffic and that sort of thing. So, sorry for running through that so quickly, but uh, like I said, I wanted to get some basic information out there about the project, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. One quick question that's interesting because it's such a concern because of the history of the bridge, change structure, change appearance, and any of that. It, it, it's interesting, it, apparently it must be ODOT that's, it, that's demanding that you change the barrier from the traffic because that's never failed in the history of the bridge and no car has ever hit the seal structure. I sit there and wonder because it, it is a visual major change to that bridge. Why would they bother since it's, it's never failed? Well, um, it's never <laughs> failed, but doesn't, doesn't mean it couldn't fail. Well, that doesn't mean a new no, I understand, but, but in 60, <laughs> Almost 70 years mm -hmm. with all the truck traffic, and it's got less truck traffic on it now than it ever used to. Right. But I'm just curious. Well, um, we're, you know, we could we could we could look at that about preserving that. I mean, that that's an alternative. That um, it was scoped to include a new rail simply because the existing rail doesn't meet current standards, and that and that's the only reason why. I think of Jersey barriers when you say barriers. Are well, you talking a big concrete structure? Are you talking metal? No. We're yeah. talking a steel, steel tube. tube. Yep. Steel That's tube. Pretty ugly on that bridge. <laughs> well, there is there is some detail we can do to make it a little less ugly, but it's still a two two yeah. tube steel rail. Yeah. Kids walk on that a lot. Skateboard on those. Yeah. yeah. They're used to that. So far, they haven't fallen off that I know. But uh, no. a steel round tube may. Uh, Present a challenge. Yeah, skateboard. especially with a yeah. post every eight feet. You can't yeah. run a skateboard staff on it. No, they'll go four foot, five yeah. foot. Yep. So that's that's exactly the kind of info we'll be looking for in our open house session. Yes, sir. I heard the the paint on the paint twenty to thirty year. Uh, I heard that there's algae slash mildew uh, resistant paint on the market. Is that something that you're going to be using at all, or is that? Uh, regulated required something else that you have? Well, ODOT, um, ODOT puts a lot of money into <coughs> research, and they do that to sort of benefit everybody uh, in the state. Um, they have a system um, that, you know, paint, paint went downhill for a long time there when, when lead paint went away and then you couldn't use the heavy oils and that sort of thing. Paint went downhill pretty significantly. Um, it would you'd be lucky to get a 10-year life out of a steel painting system. Now uh, today, uh, paints are epoxy-based. They're um, uh, they're well, they're called organics because they have a lot of carbon in them. But um, let's see. I'm trying to think of a good example of a bridge that was painted. The uh, uh, Corvallis single-lane swing bridge crossing the Willamette from downtown on uh, Highway 34. That bridge uh, was painted five years ago with a new uh, acrylic painting system, and that stuff is is heavy duty. In fact, sometimes when they over when contractors overspray and they get it on the concrete and you have to make them scrape it off, you can't you can't get it off. It's it's a real problem. So we're looking at a system probably like that. Um, like I said, ODOT's put Something a lot of research. Similar to automotive, then. 
Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's heavy duty stuff. So it's not a, it's not. Uh, uh, Trying to think of the plastic latex. Polymer? Latex. Oh. It's not latex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we only use latex on these bridges. How uh, bird proof is it for the acid? <laughs> well, it's holding up pretty good in Cooper Palace. So. so you're not aware of the algae mildew type paint that I read about? No, you, um, I'm not, although we could research that. Yeah. It may just be for house paint. I don't know. You know I right. just I read an article somewhere and I remember reading that. Do you have a painting consultant on your team? Or? We do. Um, uh, the former ODOT paint specialist uh, was on staff with ODOT for about 15 years. It's not Bear, then, Mr. No, it's not. It's uh, Bear Painting, which is one of the companies that does this type of work, is what we've used up at the uh, water towers. And they use that type of paint uh, put on, and it's kind of checked very closely on how thick it is yeah, and it lasts a long time and it seems to be doing well up there so uh, it Usually, is a special yeah, dynamic paints on the inside of tanks because it, it's not uh, it won't bleed chemicals into the drinking yeah. water but um, the, the outside but is a heavy duty coat like you should say. be heavy duty acrylic yeah we don't have pigeons roosting on the water tank. <laughs> right inside of it. No, that's that's why you hear a shot. Not, we hope it. They hope they're not inside of it. <laughs> no, the, the, the stuff held, holds up pretty well acids, and that's that's the problem with bird droppings. And where we have opportunities to do so, we're looking at putting some some simple, easy to maintain bird exclusion measures, some spikes or maybe nettings over openings, that sort of thing. And that, that should help. Color-wise, are they going to go back to the original color of the bridge, which was dark green? That's, I mean, is that generally what they yeah, do? That, that's what uh, Shippo would prefer. Mm -hmm. But I think we may have some latitude there because the bridge has been slightly different colors over the years. I think there's. there's well, we've done all of our new, new changes in the original dark green to match. I think part of the thinking was to Someday. match what the bridge would look like when it's redone. So that's right. yeah. one our, of the reasons why we went with that theme. Yeah. Our railing is that dark green. Yeah. For that reason, we thought the bridge would go back that way. Okay. And yeah. we have the new light structures on that fancy sidewalk, uh, which may fit on that bridge. I don't know how Shippo is going to be on light structures. So. Well, I, um, if we can't find the originals, we're <laughs> it's a guessing game as to what the original was like if we're going to return it to the original character. Mm -hmm. Next best thing is to return it, to, to, uh, to bring it up to date with what the neighborhood standards yeah. look like. Those aren't the original. Um, what is a phase one seismic upgrade? Yeah. And what phase level of earthquake will it stand up to or fall down? A with phase it? one seismic retrofit will keep the superstructure from falling off the piers in a thousand year earthquake. Uh, it won't improve the foundations because it's just it's, it's, it's incredibly expensive to go below ground and improve foundations for structures like these. But it's very economical. Most, most bridges that do fail during a seismic event do so simply because the, the span falls off the pier. So what we'll do is we'll put seismic restrainers. We'll keep them, they'll be mounted to the top of the pier where the truss comes down and, and sits on the pier. They'll be mounted on top of the pier, connected to the inside of the, the uh, steel truss framing system. So if you stand directly underneath it, you'll be able to see it. But if you view it from the side, you shouldn't be able to see, see the retrofit. I want to expand on, uh, since the city does have the water intake just downstream, of uh, how you can encapsulate the, the bridge. And sure. We can talk about that and, and traffic. What, what's traffic going to look like? In this so, these are just a couple of exhibits from our original concept proposal. Uh, these will be developed more fully. You can kind of see what, that's what a 2 2 braille looks like, by the way, <laughs> without any special detailing to pretty it up. It is pretty utilitarian. Um, let's see, containment. This is lead paint. Um, so abatement's going to need to occur under extremely um, controlled, uh, in a, a controlled environment. And we don't want to do, we don't want to put any structure in the water because if we do that, the permitting time and cost is just prohibitive. So we plan to uh, put a, a hard deck underneath the truss span and it will be suspended from the truss itself. Uh, lightweight system, nice hard deck, uh, and that system is great because you can wrap that thing in plastic and tent, tent the bridge. 
create a negative, um, a negative <coughs> air, uh, pressure. air pressure environment. So it all goes through help, help, help the filter. So they'll tape the thing up, they'll make it as tight as they can possibly get it, and then they'll put a negative pressure in it. So, so if there is airborne dust and there's a breach in the, in the plastic uh, containment system, what, air's coming in instead of dust getting out. It'll all go through a HEPA filter system and be collected. Um, and then everything is washed down, all collected and disposed of before they